So Great we're here know. with Logan McCullough, who's a, a longtime friend of Insect Shield and um, has, has had you know, his own um, challenges with Lyme disease. Uh, we wanna talk to him today and find out you know, how, how he got to where he is today and his experience with Lyme, because I think a lot of people share that experience. Um, and then kind of go from there, see what you're up to today. So Logan, welcome to our uh, blog and, and uh, video interviews. Thank you, Mark. It's great to, uh, to spend some time with you. Um, as you well know, I, I know your predecessor very well, Janine Robertson. Um, I found my way to Insect Shield back in the fall of 2012. And I was connected by a, a Lyme disease friend by the name of Dorothy Leland from a not-for-profit um, called LymeDisease.org. And at that time, I was recovering after more than a year-long battle with what I learned at the time was what's sometimes called disseminated Lyme disease or chronic Lyme disease. I had gotten bitten by a bunch of ticks on a backpacking trip with my son in May of 2011, about 15 months before I found, found uh, Janine and, and Dorothy through Insect Shield. Um, and classic story, um, I, I actually found the ticks on me when I woke up in camp that morning. They had gotten on me, obviously, during the hike in with my son and my dog. I had gone to bed that night and woke up the next morning with that itchy feeling like uh, chiggers. Found about 20 deer, deer tick nymphs attached anywhere from between my toes up to my waist. Mm. After that morning with fine needle nose tweezers, I was an experienced backpacker and I, I at least knew how to remove them properly. And did I sat there for about an hour pulling these off? Oh, wow! Didn't hit, know enough, Mark, at the time to save samples of them because you could have the ticks tested. I learned later. Right. But I saw my life. I'd grown up in Kentucky, spent my summers on my grandmother's farm. This was nothing new, and I thought, well, I'm just getting all these off. No, no big deal. And uh, within about six weeks. I started to develop some, some odd symptoms. I was an athlete, I was a competitive cyclist. And in hindsight, I realized that I missed at least one tick in my groin area, which is a very common place for ticks to attach. Right. You know, they, they love skin where blood vessels are close to the surface. Mm -hmm. And they also find places where they can stay hidden for at least two days, which is, you know, what they take for their feeding cycle, to finish right. their meal, well, they have to stay attached. So I started getting sick that um, summer. I went to my doctor. He had the, uh, the notion that I found out later is so common that unless you're a resident of one of what they consider 13 endemic states for Lyme disease, mostly through New England, Mid-Atlantic, and some Midwestern and California, yeah. my doctor thought there's no Lyme disease in Kentucky and looked at every other thing but Lyme disease and it was all the way until that fall mark about six months later that I had developed cognitive problems memory issues aphasia where I would lose words um, I was having a hard time driving back and forth to work mm -hmm. in my own town in a route that I'd driven for eight and a half years I would literally I have to pull over to the side of the road from time to time because I couldn't figure out where I was uh, in a map. Really disturbing stuff. And I finally found my way to a Lyme specialist up in, in, in uh, the Cincinnati, Ohio area. There were no Lyme specialists in Kentucky. Mm. And, and um, got diagnosed with a clinical diagnosis, which is what the CDC recommends because the blood tests are so poor, so inaccurate for Lyme disease. And over the course of the next year, um, did an intense treatment protocol. And long story short, about a year later, I finally started seeing some light at the end of the tunnel. And by the end of the following summer, 2012, I had recovered enough physically that I was cycling again, uh, hiking and backpacking again. I had learned a tremendous amount about Lyme disease in the interim. I'd found a Lyme support group in Louisville mm -hmm. that I had just started a month before I was diagnosed. Since then, we've had four or 500 people come through that support group over the last 10 years, wow. all in that area that supposedly doesn't have Lyme disease. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, I, had this, I had this crazy notion, Mark, after all that I'd learned, and I was a nonprofit executive. My job was to be an advocate, a public speaker. I was a media relations specialist. Communication was a big part of my job. And I thought, all right, I'm getting some of my health back. I feel physically pretty good again. Mentally, I've still got problems. I was working at the American Red Cross at the time, and I got this notion that I was going to leave my job because I was still having a very hard time mentally um, with what they call executive functioning. I couldn't multitask. Yeah. I couldn't hold things in mind. Sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a bucket list item. I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to sell my house and most of my possessions. And I'm going to try and hike the Appalachian Trail, which is something I'd always wanted to do for 20 years that had been on my mind. Hmm. But I'm going to do it as an advocacy effort to try and draw uh, awareness to Lyme disease. Right. So as a part of that effort, I wrote a business plan, if you will. I, I recruited one of my best friends who was a, a, a chief operating officer at a local bank. I said, would you be my, my chief operating officer? And we want to try and do project that, that brings grassroots awareness to the fact that Lyme exists in many places that aren't commonly understood and to teach some of the things that I'd learned over the years that year mark about um, the life cycle of ticks where you're most risk where you're not and I started working with Lyme disease.org a not-for-profit based in California mm -hmm. and there by the name of of Dorothy Leland, knew your predecessor, Janine Roberts, Robertson, and she said, Logan, you ought to get in touch with Insect Shield. We think the world of their products and the science behind the use of permethrin as yeah. a preventative. And so I did. And Janine was so gracious. And I sent her my business plan and my media plan and how I was going to try and draw attention. And she was kind enough to send me an outfit. Mark, I had actually already bought some Insect Shield products from a friend of mine that managed a local outdoor store, hmm. wound up sponsoring me too for, for shoes and some other equipment. And I wound up hiking the Appalachian Trail from Maine down to Georgia. I started in, in midsummer. Um, timing wise, that's as early as I could get started. I couldn't make the spring season. But I thought, well, I'll hike south because I'll pass. 90% of the people that hike it, hike it north to south, I'll meet them on the trail. Mm -hmm. I'll do videos with them. I'll pass along information that could keep them safe. And so I did that. And I wore my insect shield clothing mark for the entire five months I was on the trail. And literally over that five month period, I never once had to even pull a crawling tick off of my clothing or my gear. I wore mm -hmm. extra pants. I had an um, insect shield t-shirt and shirt that Janine had sent me and socks. Mm -hmm. I had, this is the actual, one of the actual gaiters that I, I wore for that 2000 mile trip. Pretty, pretty worn out. It's since done a cross country trip that I did a couple of years later from Delaware to, to uh, California, trying to do some of the same work. And um, ever since then, you know, I've been a, a complete advocate for, the science behind your product yeah. and you know i i have can testify that whenever i've been wearing my insect shield clothing i have never had a tick on me not even crawling on me that i ever found yeah. i've been bitten by ticks since then but it was when i wasn't wearing the clothing i i got bit on a cycling trip across wow. country i thought i was safe because i was sitting in a cut grass front yard right typically is safe but i wound up with a tick on me that night so yeah. so i've been you know trying to teach people ever since then um this is 10 years now mm. i've been doing uh lectures i've done presentations at the university of louisville at uh, cemeteries where the groundskeepers are all exposed oh, to yeah. ticks uh, boy sure. scout troops all different kinds of groups that would allow me to come in and and give a talk and mm. one of my major pieces of advice is this technology works um it's much safer wearing clothing that's treated rather than putting toxic chemicals on your skin right not a big fan of deet yeah 
super found deep, particularly effective against ticks. It does work right. against mosquitoes, but, and I'm not trying to poo-poo, you know, using that as a tool, but just knowing that every time you smear toxic chemical on your skin, it's not only working against the insects, but it's absorbing through your, your pores into your bloodstream. Yeah. yeah. And that's good for your immune system. And, you know, the other thing I recommend, uh, side by side with insect shield and with permethrin and that technology is concentrate on building up your immune system because the number one defense against all tick-borne illnesses is a healthy immune system hmm. people that get bit don't get sick because their immune system fights it off yeah I, in hindsight that i had had some immuno express uh, suppressive experiences before i got bitten that degraded my immune system enough that those 20 ticks were able to kind of tip me over the edge and, and get right. me sick. So right. that's kind of 30,000 foot view of how I found my way to you guys and, and, uh, and how I've stayed safe for the last 10 years. You know, yeah. I, I'm not going to be dissuaded from going back out and doing something I love. And I, I don't teach fear. I teach knowledge and, Knowledge is power, and I'm not afraid at all to go back yeah. out in the woods and enjoy what I love. Yeah, that's really uh, great. I'm so glad to hear about that. I mean, you know, I've been uh, at Insect Shield for about a year and a half, and yeah, um, getting to know the work that Janine uh, Robertson did here, it's been really neat. Um, she's established a lot of relationships, and, and we do try to do that, uh, you know, support folks that, that are into this kind of effort. I mean, whatever it may be. And uh, one of the nice things is that people are creative and they come up with different ways to, you know, to promote and, and spread awareness, um, that kind of thing. We did an interview here a week or so ago with Steve Baker, who's somebody else that we work with. And his whole effort was around bringing um, repellent nets, bed nets to uh, people in South America. So that, you know, that was something he got onto and he, we started treating the nets for him and it really grew um, into a, a big deal. So he's still working on that kind of stuff. And we really do like to support that. We'll treat people's clothing. It's not always, you know, that they may have stuff that, that's more specialized and like the, the gators that, that you showed, you know, we don't sell gators, but we um, license our permethrin treatment to like outdoor research and some of these other uh, companies these so research, yeah outdoor skaters outdoor research shirt right uh, i'll model for you these are these are rail riders another one of your uh, brand partners these are yeah. pants right. that are treated yeah are, I mean, one of the things that i i feel so and you know this but i say this for your viewers you know i'm i'm, I'm a volunteer um i'm partnered with insect shield from the standpoint that that i'm i'm an ambassador for your product and the only remuneration that's ever come from you guys is some pieces of clothing mm -hmm. to help keep you safe but what i really respect through the years is that insect shield really puts their money where their mouth is and for your viewers um insect shield sponsored the creation of two really really well done education videos um, this is the last time I got to work with Janine about um, four years ago in partnership with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy nonprofit. Um, we all went to Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, hmm. and Institute Shield produced um, two videos that are all about prevention and early intervention. You know, things like how to safely remove a tick. And these are hosted on your website. They're on the Appalachian Trail Conservancy website. The ATC tries to make those videos available to all folks that are thinking about hiking the Appalachian Trail as a through hike or just day hikers. Right. And I just to say for your for your viewers and readers, each of those videos are about seven minutes long, and that's the best fifteen minutes you can invest mm. to keep yourself and people you love safe. Yeah. Uh, whether you're using these products or not, this knowledge is really really important. Mm. Yeah, that's really true. I mean, one of the great things is, you know, that some of the organizations that we work with, I mean, you can just reach even more people. So you're making somebody aware 
and then they can share that, uh, you know, people that, that care, you know, that they're uh, have uh, family members or uh, whatever else, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks are just kind of waking up to this issue of Lyme disease. And like you mentioned, um, they're still confronting this um, sort of lack of, of knowledge around the disease and even doctors, you know, are not, uh, up on it. Um, and that tends to cause some serious issues because people are spending like a year before they actually get a diagnosis yeah. of Lyme, which, you know, as we know, it's, it's really detrimental to, to let it go that long. Um, Absolutely. It's a good point. And there, there's so many other tick-borne illnesses beyond Lyme. It's very, very common that when someone gets infected with one tick-borne illness, they more than likely will have more than one. Yeah. I had or uh, co-infection, they call it, called Bartonella, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes known as cat scratch fever, a variety of, of Bartonella. But there's things like Babesia or Lichiosis, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. That's one that's right. more well known. And a lot of these ticks carry multiple pathogens. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's not just Lyme disease that, that may be getting the most notoriety, rightly so, mm -hmm. because... It is one of the fastest growing worldwide epidemics, mm -hmm. not alone. So these, yeah. these preventative steps that you take um, make so much sense on many levels. You know, right. ticks, are, right. ticks are little schools for pathogens, no doubt about it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something that we don't know a lot about. I mean, we're, um, I'm ho hoping to do an interview here coming up with um, a woman who is a researcher in the area of how that, you know, the pathogens get passed from the tick to, to the uh, human host or other uh, hosts, you know, whether it's mice or um, some of the other, I, I think squirrels are susceptible. Uh, but there's a lot of unknowns, you know, in terms of how that's um, carried from one animal to another and how the cells work together and stuff like that. So just kind of still in, the, in its infancy in terms of how we can handle this stuff. But like you said, I mean, that's a really, really good point about the immune system. Yes. Because we know, you know, people, I mean, that happens uh, in other instances where people get mononucleosis and then they're susceptible to even more stuff, you know, it just right. can be kind of a cascading effect. Um, so ticks just as much. Um, so yeah, I mean, we really appreciate the work that you've done and uh, hope to continue to support you in these efforts, you know. You also made a good point about the video, which is something that we have um, pretty strong capability with, you know. We have a team um, that produced, I, I'm pretty sure they did the one that you're referring to, and we're still working on, on getting more of that out there because we can go on location make the videos we've done some for uh, like medical teams international they do work in africa uh, we went over there and, and made some ed educational videos about that stuff malaria you know for um, most people know about malaria but they don't know se the severity of it right yeah so right i mean you know in terms of the impact did you feel like lime do you feel as good as you did before or you still feel like this is something yeah no um you know mark if i if i caught it early if i'd been educated properly um it would have probably probably been a much more complete recovery um i i have still health deficits 10 years later mm. uh, you know some of which are cognitive although i feel close to what i did before Mentally, I don't, I don't have near of the uh, executive functioning deficits that I did before. I, I, uh, I, I'm, you know, working part time again, but in honesty, honest, you know, full disclosure, a big part of the health issues that I continue to have, Mark, have to do with the treatment for mm -hmm. trying to tackle Lyme, you know, six months after you've been bitten. Right. If you catch it early, you know, and I mean, within the first couple of days, short course of antibiotics, namely doxycycline, is, is highly effective against Lyme and several of the other tick-borne illnesses. Yeah. You, when you miss it, then treating becomes much more uh, lengthy and toxic. Mm -hmm. Right. And the, the, the side effects of toxic medical treatments 
you know, can, can linger as much as the, 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 the disease does, excuse me. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm functional, but no, I, I'm definitely not where I was 10, you know, prior to the tick bites. Um, right. And I, and I, uh, and I tell people that, you know, not as a, a fear inducing um, thing, because you can get your life back after an illness like that. And I did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of people that haven't. I know so many chronic Lyme patients that are still struggling 10, 20, 30 years yeah. of because of what you said, how little understood it is. Yeah. Not a lot of, of research funding going into these tick-borne illnesses. They're just no. really, it's, it's, it's uh, kind of shocking how few dollars from a federal standpoint from NIH and, and the CDC are going into tick-borne disease uh, illness right. research. Yeah, so preventive yeah. is number one. And, and when I talk about the immune system, I talk to people about watching what they eat, of getting exercise, your mental attitude, mm-hmm. that fear does not strengthen your immune system. So don't be afraid of ticks. Be knowledgeable, knowledgeable about them. Right. And minimizing things like toxins that can suppress your immune system. So things like toxic insect repellent. I'm not a fan. If it yeah. between that and getting malaria, then then yes, use them where you need to, but try sure. to use them sparingly. You know, your technology, as you described so well on your website, is that the chemical is bonded to the fabric layers themselves. Yeah. It's much safer to have a piece of clothing on you that's not being absorbed through your pores. Yeah. Yes, it's contact with you, but but I feel that that's, you know, I've done my research and I feel pretty confident it's safe. Mm-hmm. But that's very different than anything you put on your skin, yeah. including hygiene products, deodorants, shampoos, all those things that have chemicals that aren't good for your immune system. Be aware right. of that. So, yeah. Good point. Uh, I mean, we maybe we should stress this more, but the, the process of bonding, you know, as they say, like for Mathrin, the chemical is a pesticide and it's been used as a pesticide. But once it's bonded to clothing and using the process that we do, it's no longer considered a pesticide. It, it becomes, oh, right. a, 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 yeah, it's, it's a repellent. And it is like you say, it's not being absorbed. I mean, the amount that's being bonded to the clothes is quite low. And then the fact that it's not being applied to your skin, you know, is, is the determining factor for the risk. I mean, that's that's what makes it a much lower risk. When I, when I give presentations to families um, and youth groups like Boy Scouts and, and the like, one of your services that I, I strongly promote is sending your own clothing into Insect Shield and yeah. they will use the, you know, you guys will use the same bonding treatment with people's clothes, guarantee it for 70 washings, which is basically right. the life of a garment and this is particularly useful for children who are outgrowing their outfits every year. Yeah. So I think parents, you know, rather than going and buying from a retail store and then a year later before it's worn out, you know, if it's not worn out, you've got to get a new one. Right. Choose, choose the clothing that your child will wear voluntarily anyway, the, the yeah. clothing they like yeah. um, and that they use in the outdoors and send it in and get it treated. That's very yeah. economical. Yeah. Now I will use, as, as you mentioned, I will use the spray on treatments, but I don't use those on my clothing anymore. I use those on my equipment. Mm-hmm. So I spray the bottom of my backpack where it's going to make contact with the ground. I would spray the, the um, straps of my hammock that would make mm-hmm. contact with a tree. So if tick gets on them, they're going to get off pretty quick. Right. And I think spray on treatment, you know, is, is definitely useful, but for me personally, I, I like the treated fabric, yeah. especially fabric. It's just more economical in the long run and it's more effective and it's safer. Right. Yeah, it really is. I mean, we, we sell a spray um, and, and that is exactly for that reason. Like people have some item of clothing that they want to just quickly treat or, or whatever, but to, to get it treated, that is bonding it, you know, by, by a heat process. And, and then it's good. I mean, it lasts for five times as long as, a, as the spray does. So yeah, we try to encourage people to do that. I, they're, they're not, uh, I'm not aware of any other uh, company that offers that service, you know, with, with their treatment. So 
sending it in. Okay. And, and we get we get a lot of good feedback about that. You know, um, it's very very reasonably priced. Very yeah. reasonably. Priced. Well, and when you think about it, uh, and you know, the like you said, immune system number one, and and number two, it's just the ease of putting on clothes. You know. I'm still kind of amazed that when I find like the tips, um, people, you see a lot of coverage these days in newspapers and online stuff. And they say, you know, ticks are getting worse and Lyme disease is, is awful. But then in their tips for avoiding, uh, you know, tick bites, it, it never mentions uh, treated clothing, which is surprising just because it's so easy to go that route. And, yeah. You know, not, not a, it's just one more line of defense, as we say. And the spray, I mean, the thing about, um, well, the, the applying, you know, the topical uh, treatments like DEET is that, you know, we've had other people on this uh, show and they've said like, look, you put that on your skin, the tick just crawls right across it. They don't, you know, they're, they're like, I, I, I'm going somewhere else. I, I don't, you know, and you're not going to put it all over your body. So um, it, it just doesn't do the, the protective thing. No, not at all. Yeah. And ticks are not jumping out of trees. They're, you know, they're, they're crawling up from brush. Uh, yeah, I, one of the things that, that I was reading about is like they're, they're, one reason that ticks are not as bad in certain areas is that they tend to sit uh, further down on, on the grass and stuff. And the ones that are higher up, those are the ones that get you when, you know, you brush by. Uh, no, you're, so it's just an awareness. It is, you know, one of the uh, the gentlemen that partnered with uh, Insect Shield and the Appalachian Trail Conservancy to to uh, produce those videos was another through hiker who was a tick researcher, mm. and you know, synchronicity of synchronicities, he hiked the Appalachian Trail the same season I did. We found each other in some forums before we started. Mm. His name is Dr. Carl Ford, Carl with a K, and his trail name is Speed. And he hiked from Georgia to Maine. We actually almost met each other in New Hampshire and, and uh -huh. literally figured out later we passed each other on the street. But he did mark a survey, a research survey all along the Appalachian Trail, uh -huh. taking um, tick samples. And what he found was above a certain altitude, the tick populations plummeted and it was much less risky. And I think he published what he found above 2,700 feet in elevation on the AT, especially when you stayed at trail shelters, you were relatively safe at those higher elevations. Down in those low-lying areas where the humidity is high because ticks have to have moisture or they you know, dry out and die. And those vegetated areas where they can crawl up and quest, they call it, stick those two front legs out and grab onto animals, including us, as you pass by. Yeah. They pick up on those environmental signals, your carbon dioxide, and they know you're coming, body heat. Um, they're really well-adapted little creatures. I'm out in Wyoming, as I shared with you, and I'm at almost 8,000 feet elevation. And I know from Carl's research and others, I'm, I'm pretty safe up here. You know, it's not likely that I'm going to cross pass with a tick at 8,000 feet, but it's not unheard of. It's no. just just less likely and just knowing those things help you be vigilant where you need to be vigilant if you've crossed through a grassy low-lying vegetated area right. stop the tick check on the other side of that of that uh, of that area don't right. wait till that night do it right then yeah. those are the kind of things that that i teach and when you know those things then the fear level just plummets away because you know here i'll be vigilant here I can relax a little bit more and, yeah. uh, you know, and, and hike safely. Yeah. I think people don't often realize that the ticks have these different stages of development. So the the like, you know, most people could recognize a tick. I think if they, if they see one in this larger sort of adult stage, yeah. uh, the, like you mentioned, the, the nymphal ticks, uh, those are really like the size of a, a pin point and and to see those you know so you you got to check i mean you gotta gotta be able to check for those um i keep a uh i don't have it handy i should have thought to get it out i keep um some acrylic discs 
that another advocate that I met on the Appalachian Trail in, in Southwest Virginia, who runs a dog grooming business and was constantly, as she would groom the dogs in that area, pulling thousands of ticks off. And she mm-hmm. Lyme disease herself and was a part of a nonprofit group there. Um, as a matter of fact, her picture is with me on your website, on, on wow. the little page of mine. Uh, her picture's there. And as her advocacy, she would create these little um, clear plastic acrylic discs and put three tick samples in each one of them that were labeled. Mm. A, a larval tick, which is almost microscopic. The nymphal tick, which is the second stage you mentioned, which is about the size of a fine pepper flake. And you really have to look. Most disease transmission comes from nymphal ticks, the second yeah. stage of the life cycle. because People don't know they're bitten. They don't see them. Right. You know, what more reason to wear light colored clothing as mm-hmm. you can see I'm crawling on this, not on blue jeans or camouflage, that kind of right. thing. I did a lot of hunter education as mm-hmm. I'd meet hunters on the Appalachian Trail because they are very vulnerable. And then the adult ticks are much easier to see. Right. Because of that, they get removed more commonly and yeah. and are, are less of a disease transmitter than the nymphal yeah. ticks are but yeah. it's shocking when you see how small those those little things are and like i said i had 20 of the nymphal ticks mm-hmm. if you had super i do have these handy these are my tweezers yeah and these are like needles at right. the end right and when you're trying to get a nymphal tick off the last thing you want to do is squeeze that body yeah most yeah. of the bacteria they carry are in their gut. Right. There are mouth pieces too, but you try to get it right at the base of that skin and pull it out, which yeah. uh, is in the video that you guys produced. You know, we actually demonstrated how to how to pull one off with these very tweezers. So right. Yeah, it's really important. Um, I mean, one of the things that, that I learned recently is that you know the tick actually carries a kind of uh, numbing agent. And so that is part of its little strategy, you know, evolutionarily, uh, is when it's biting, it numbs that area. So you just, you know, you're less aware of the bite itself. Um, yeah, actually, it secretes a type of cement, too, because it literally glues itself. It not only has, you look at a tick's mouth parts under a microscope, and it looks like a sawfish snout. Right. Herbs that are angled backwards, so it punctures your skin spreads its snout and anchors itself and then secretes this cement and glues itself to your skin and like you said it has it has an analgesic that numbs the area because it needs to stay hidden right and you know when you when as a pure scientist when you look at them they're amazing creatures because they're so well adapted to survive yeah but when you understand you know some of these techniques they use you understand why it's really important when you do remove a tick mm-hmm. that you have it at the base right i always tell people pull a little piece of your skin off yeah with you want to get those mouth parts and pull steadily backwards slow right. and steady because right. you don't want to suck the tick no you know, and, no. and eventually finally those barbs will let loose and the cement will let loose and, and the tick will come off but you don't want to use a burnt match you don't want to use no. chemicals right. anything that irritates that tick means it may regurgitate yeah. it's got confidence and so those right. are a lot of the things we talk about like in the videos that you guys produced those are the things when you understand um the basics then the fear level goes way down and you don't right. have to be worried about enjoying the activities that you love you're, yeah. you're prepared so you're ready to to deal with that precisely Wow. Uh, well, I, I really appreciate you coming on today, uh, Logan, and, and sharing some of your experience. And I think there are a lot of people out there that have felt the same thing. Um, we'll put links below the video to um, the things that you've mentioned and some of the other resources that we offer. Uh, there are a lot of good groups. You know, you mentioned support groups. Um, we know that some of the, yep. some of the Lyme organizations that we work with with they've got uh support group networks you know yeah, now yeah. that there's a, a lot of online stuff out there was that group that you went to in uh in kentucky it, was it 
face to face. I mean, you, you actually went in person and met with those guys. Yeah, they, uh, they literally had just had their very first meeting the month before I was diagnosed. And I found them through a national resource. There's a website called LimeNet that's a patient forum. Mm -hmm. And you could post uh, a request on their forum to find a Lyme doctor specialist in your area. So I posted on there to find one in Kentucky, which I later found out there were none in Kentucky. But one of the forum members was the lady that co-founded my local Lyme support group. And she responded to me, told me where I could find a doctor in Ohio, and then mentioned to me, hey, we just started in Louisville, Kentucky, a brand new Lyme support group. And I went to their second meeting in November of 2011. Hmm. And they're still, they're like a lot of organizations now. They're more Zoom based over the last hmm. year. But we've literally, you know, started out with a, a dozen people. And through the years, Mark, because of the explosion of Lyme disease, you know, um, the, the white footed mouse is one of the major typhoid right. type vectors that the the ticks actually get the bacteria, the Lyme bacteria from mostly rodents, but they're not, you, like you said before, it's not just mice, it's other, other ones too. Yeah. But the white-footed mouse population, mouse populations in general have exploded in urban and suburban areas because mm -hmm. we've wiped out all their predators. Yeah. Snakes and foxes and um, a lot of other tick predators like possums, we've, we've affected that, that balance. Mm -hmm why you're seeing such an explosion of ticks that are infected with Lyme disease and passing it on to yeah. on to humans. So that's how I found my local support group. And you're right, there are support groups in all 50 states, you know, including Hawaii and, and Alaska, but um, in the lower 48 in, in particular, from California to Minnesota to the New England states, and all the way down in the south where you know ticks are very prevalent and all across the southeast and southern u.s yeah we'll put some links uh below the video to those that we're aware of and i you know in general those organizations if you contact them if you're looking for more info they'll they'll put you in touch with that too i so. mentioned earlier how i found you guys and that was through lymedisease.org yeah they're the oldest not-for-profit and uh, it's really good re online resource yeah. for information and uh, Q&A. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Logan. Uh, we really appreciate it. We'll, we'll be posting this soon. Um, we hope to have you back and find out uh, what you're up to in the future. Sounds great, Mark. It's great to spend uh, some time with you. Yeah, thanks a lot.